Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to speak on the subject, breaking the law. of sin and death. Jesus break the law. Our focus today is the power of the law of the resurrection. The power of the law of the resurrection. Breaking the law of sin and death. I want to begin with a few statements you may want to write down. Some of you have been to the cemetery recently to perhaps bury a family member or supporting a friend who had perhaps death in the family. The cemetery is a common place for humans because that's where everybody goes eventually. But I want to focus on a law that makes the cemetery necessary. Let me first of all clarify some things about God. Death is a law. Write that down. It's a law. Death is a law. How do we know this? Well, let's read what the Bible says about death. Because man made death legal. Death used to be illegal. It was not active. But death became a law because of something we did. Here's a statement you want to remember. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. It says these words, he has set us free from the law of sin and the law of death. Look at that verse. The law of the spirit of life, life is a law, has made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. I told you that death is a law. And what I'm going to share with you in this session is going to change your perspective of the power of law. Everything God has ever created was designed to function by law. Please write that down. Everything God created was designed to function by law. Life and freedom is really only possible where law is present. You cannot have life without a law, and you cannot have freedom without law. And that leads then to my third point. Law was given to protect life and freedom. Whenever a country creates a law, that law is supposed to protect life and protect freedom among the people. That principle is key to my next point. The first law God gave man was the law of life. The first gift God gave man was life. The second law God gave man was law. <laughs> God told the man, you shall become a living soul. God acted first and God breathed into this man's dirt body and gave him life. The first law God gave man was life. But God suddenly gave him a second law. It was the law of law. He told him what not to do. And he told him why he shouldn't do it. That leads me to my 
fifth point. Adam was given the power of law. Whenever someone gives you law, they also gave you power. What kind of power? Power to break that law. It's like a child. <laughs> when a parent tells a child, do not touch that particular thing. He just gave that child a law. I think all of us know how children are. Whenever you tell them not to do something, a funny spirit comes upon them. I was never like that, of course. I was being a perfect child. Of course not. Somehow, there is this temptation to test law. So whenever you're given law, you're given power. What kind of power? Power to test that law. Power to even break it. So when God gave man life, the law of life, he suddenly gave him another law. And that law was to protect the first law God gave him. The first law God gave man was life. It found in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. It says, the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into him what? The breath of life. The first law God gave man was life. And man became a living soul. Now listen carefully because this will help you through the rest of the year. God gave man life. Anything you give life, you automatically gave it death. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think about this. First of all, God told the man, first law, living soul, you got life. The second law is found in Genesis 2.15. It says, and the Lord took the man that had life, put him in what? The garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man. Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. He has the man who's full of life, a living soul. He put him in a beautiful environment, and he told him, you are free. But then he put this other law. A commandment is a law. What's the commandment? You are free. Boy, we love freedom. But remember, freedom without law is anarchy. It's impossible to have freedom without boundaries. So God says you are free to eat from what? Say it loud. Any tree. Man, that's a big blank check. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So he gave him a second law. First law, life. Second law, freedom. But then he introduced this strange concept. Now I want to talk about freedom first. The word free means liberty, and the word dom is from the word dominion. So freedom means liberty to dominate your environment. You are free. You got freedom. Not to dominate people. But fish and birds and cattle and plants and things that creep along the ground. You get freedom to dominate that environment. But then God quickly establishes another law. Now, I want you to check something here with me. Genesis 2 verse 17. I've been sharing this for years, but it came back to me strong this morning. God created death. Death was an inactivated element. Death existed before it could kill. Read the next verse. Genesis 2 verse 15. But you must not eat uh -oh, another law. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
For the day you eat, when you eat of it, you shall what? Surely die. Who's speaking? God. Who's he talking to? Man. So who's the first one to introduce the word die? God. Did Adam know it existed? No. So die was around. Adam had no idea that Di was present. And God told Di, it can't kill. God took Di, is this good English? God took Di and made it a servant of Adam. And then God told Adam, Di is dead. Die cannot kill. You cannot die. However, if you disobey the law, you will resurrect death and give death power to kill you. That's the law. Death was present but it had no power and no influence. Why? Here's why. Because God took the power of death and put it in the hands of man. See, God says, now you get the power to keep it dead or give it life. Write this down. Because you can, should you? This is a strange statement. God says, look, all of creation is now under your control, Adam. Every animal, every plant, every insect, every bird, everything in this planet, every bacteria under your control, including death. Because you could do something, should you do it? Adam could keep death dead. Or he can give death life. Ladies and gentlemen, our problem is our forefather decided to give death life. How did he do it? I found out how he did it. This is strange. Here's how he did it. Write this down. It's very important to understand how the, the, the law works. It says... The power of law is in the hands of man. Think about what God did. God says, die is in this garden. Because die is in life. And you got the power of the law of life. I gave you life. You can protect life by keeping the law. Look at Genesis 2 17. It says, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. That's a law. For in the day that you eat from it, you will what? Surely die. When will you die? The day. The day. Here's what God was telling him The day that you violate the law, you create a new law. This explains the Bahamas and Jamaica and Barbados and America. It explains the problems in all of our countries. This one principle. Whenever you break a law, you create a new law. You see... Die means death, and death is inherent in life. I'm sorry that these plants are not real. I want, I want you to think of a real plant in a pot. A living plant has life. Now, if you took the plant and break the law, what's the law of plant? Got to be in soil. So you take it out. Because you could, 
Should you? But I could take it out. The plan can't stop me. But because you could do something, should you do it? God gave man the most awesome power in existence. It's called a will. It takes will to break law. The light is red. No one is coming. The only thing holding that car to that red light is what? Your will. You can break the law. You can run that red light. But then you create another law. <laughs> Every time you break the law, there's a new law. Death is inherent in life. If I take the plant, pull it out of the soil, do I need to kill the plant? No. What have I done? I've created a new law. The law of plant death. What keeps the plant alive is keeping the law. If I break the law and pull it out of the soil, I have a new law. It's the law of plant death. Do you know that it's possible after you take it out to put it back and by some miraculous element the plant will recatch itself? In other words, whenever you break a law, hallelujah, if you catch yourself, You don't try to create another law to fix that. You got to go back to the original law and put yourself under it. Hmm. This word you may never have heard. Death is an inversion of life. Death is built into life. Death is life in reverse. This is why when you pull the plant out, it begins to die. If you put it back in, it begins to reverse the process and give life back to it. So death is already in the plant, but what's keeping death dead is keeping the plant under the law. Anybody here with me? So wherever there's death, a law was broken. And the only way to fix that law is to go back to the original law. Can I put it this way then? That death and life are in the same place. The day you eat, you will surely die. The day you eat, which means the day you eat, you had life to eat. But the day you eat, you will surely die. So death is the opposite of life. It's life in reverse. Wherever there's death, there was life. Wherever there is life, there's death. Wherever there's death, there was life. So if there is a problem with life, it's because you're violating the law. And if you're dead, you got to fix the whole situation by going back to the original law. Let me put it another way. This is very important. I call it the principal law of death. The principal law of death. Uh, when I discovered how, how this works, let me see if I can get this, this thing to function here for me here. Because I want you to, to really get this. I have another one in my bag. Can you put that in there? This is, it, this is so amazing to me because when I thought about death, I thought the devil created death. So I was fighting the devil. The devil doesn't have the pleasure of creating death. Death, devil created nothing. When God created life, death was inherent in it. So what we have is we have death in life. Death is in life. 
Is that it? Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Yeah, that's the real thing. Death was created without life. Write that one down. When God created man, God gave him the law of life. So death was present, but God called it die. God says now, whether death lives or dies depends on man. Death exists, but it has no power. So God placed the power of death in the hands of the human. Death had no life. Death had no influence over man. Death had no authority. And the power of death was in the hands of the human. God says the day you eat, you will activate death. So the law of death is in the hands of man. I discovered this much then. That death is a law. What about the law of life? Write this down quickly. Life was created by God as well. Life was created with death in it. Everything that's alive has death on the inside. The only way for it to keep death dead is for it to obey the laws that God created. So life was created without death. Life had die in it, but die could not kill because life was keeping the law. Life was created, therefore, with power over death. Life influenced and controlled death. Adam had power over death in his hands. Listen to me carefully, please. The law of life, therefore, is in the hands of man. power God gave us. Now, let me break it down. I'm moving fast for a reason, because I want to get to a point. I don't want you to forget this. Write this down. Every manufacturer creates a product with inherent laws. Your car was created by a manufacturer. I use a car all the time because most people have one or experience one. The law of cars is fuel, gasoline, oil, and some kind of liquid, water or something. These are laws. You cannot operate a car without these substance. Who, who decided that? The manufacturer decided that. You can't buy a car and say, I don't like gasoline anymore. I'm going to use some coconut water. And you fill your car with grade A coconut water. What happens to the car? It dies. <laughs> it malfunctions. Now, all products come, therefore, with inherent laws, but also inherent promises. And the promise is, if you obey these laws, the car will function. If you disobey these laws, the car will malfunction. So all products come with law. Who are we? to decide the laws of life. We didn't create life. God created everything. So we have to find out what are the laws that God put in place for us to be alive and have life on this planet. He gave life and he created the laws. And a product comes with instructions on how to keep the laws. And the product comes with guarantees. It says if you keep these laws, this product will function. God says, Adam, the whole planet is yours. Every tree is yours. All the animals under your control, the birds and the trees, you got them under your control. You got the whole thing. But here's one law. Don't touch that tree. All products come with warnings. Do not operate this product near water. Some people have tried that. And they had a shocking experience write this down. Whenever you violate law, you punish yourself. The manufacturer doesn't have to punish you. If you put gasoline, if you put orange juice in your gasoline tank, 
you don't call Ford Motor Company and say you have a problem. Ford sent a book with instructions with that, and they said, if you follow my instructions, keep those laws in that booklet, this car will serve you. It will function. It will have life. In other words, customers are responsible for keeping the law, not the manufacturer. God says, Adam, the day you eat, not me, I got a problem. I gave you life. I gave you all this food. I gave you all this power. Now the day you eat, it's all up to you. What you do will give death life. Death is as dead as you keep it. Imagine the power in the hands of one man. God doesn't keep law for people. He gives them. So customers do not create laws. Manufacturers do. God says, Adam, this is the law. You keep my commandments, you will live. You disobey my commandments. The day you disobey, you will die. That leads me to number nine. Customers obey laws. You know, it's amazing how we hate to be told what to do in our countries and, and in our homes, you know. And yet we obey Ford Motor Company. <laughs> we are more faithful to Ford than we are to God. When the car is on E, we drive it to a station. We take out our own money. And we don't like gasoline, but we still put it in there. We obey the laws of that car company. Why? We want what the car company promised. Hey, boys, say obedience. Have you ever sat down to, to try and figure out why you use gasoline in your car? How about discussing it with Ford? Call Ford and say, why do you all use gasoline? Uh, you know, the... the the, the combustion chamber with the with the ascrocious of the explain it to me no you just go and you do it am I right you don't sit down and try to figure out the scientific reasons for using that substance you don't discuss it for two weeks before you use the car I want to know why you're using this I want to understand what's in it why you use gasoline where did it come from what what does it consist of what are, what are the composites no 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 put it in God says don't fornicate why you know how I am, I'm 20. And my engine's running. God said, look, listen, just don't fornicate, okay? We want to discuss it. We want to have all kind of long talk about it. And God said, look, don't you get it? Just obey. We obey forward and negotiate with God. Customers don't, don't create laws. They just obey them. And Adam was a customer. He was a product. And he came with some laws. Laws are given to protect the product. Write this list down. Very important list here. Laws are protected by obedience. That's how you protect a law. By obedience. Laws are protected by submission. The crime in our countries right now is a result of people violating this list. They are not obedient to the law. They are not submitted to the law. And they don't agree with the law. Laws are protected by agreement. Laws are protected by understanding their impact. If I break into your house, I am breaking a law. Therefore, I am not submitting to the social agreement we have that we won't take other people's things. I'm violating the agreement. I don't agree with the agreement. You work for the fridge, I teeth it. You spend years getting a car, I steal it in five seconds. This is violating the law. And I'm impacting social stability. Therefore, the only way you keep law is by self-control. You see that car there, and you see the key in it, and ain't nobody around, and you know you can take it, but you got to control yourself. When Satan said to Eve, uh, you see that tree? She said, yeah. 
he said, you should pick that fruit. She said, God said. In other words, this woman got information from somewhere. She knew the information. She says, God said, if we do. In other words, Eve refused to control herself. She knew what not to do. Satan cannot make you sin. You decided to disobey a law. This number seven is very interesting. Laws are protected by fear and humility. If you don't fear authority, you'll violate law. There's no fear in our communities. There's no respect for, for authority. It seems like it's leaking out quickly. You have teachers having sex with students. Now, wait a minute. Something's wrong with this picture. But that's a violation of law. And, it's, and it's, there's no fear of taking advantage of a 13-year-old girl or boy, and you are 38. I mean, this is like, what are we doing here? It's simply violating law. For you to obey law, you got to be humble. Humble means you've got to be submissive. You got to say, you know something? Uh, I want to keep the order that the law creates. So let me be humble enough to submit to it. I put it this way. Man controls what happens to him. God placed in the hands of man the power of law. Man can destroy or invalidate law. You can decide to create new laws by canceling old ones. Now this is where resurrection and Good Friday comes in. Mankind can create new laws by violating old ones. I got an explosion last night in my when I figured this out. You can cancel law, but you can never eradicate them. You can disobey a law, but you can't get rid of it if it is an original law. Case in point, you can decide to put orange juice in your car. That's your power, your choice. You got the authority. And no one can stop you. That's your car. That's your orange juice. But it still doesn't change the law of gasoline. Is anybody with me? In other words, you can create a new law. My law is I will use orange juice. That's your law. That's your own personal law. You made that law. It doesn't cancel the original law. 20 legislators get together and say, we can create a new law for the rectum. Can I touch that for five seconds? Now, that's why I have problems with democracy a little bit. Democracy is a dangerous thing because democracy creates its own truth based on majority rule, not based on original rule. If enough of us agree, that the rectum is an entrance. We can pass a legislation, which is law. But that law doesn't change the original function. Is anybody here understand my simple biology? In other words, voting doesn't change law, even though voting could create law. The devil created a new law. He told Eve, if you break that law, you'll be like God. In other words, in order to create a new law, you got to break the original one. And this is where we fell apart. See, laws are destroyed by the creation of new laws. And new laws are created by what? Disobedience to old law. 
Therefore, the fall of man was simply disobedience to law. What was the law? Don't touch the tree. What did man do? He touched the tree. Now, everything else is what we're suffering from. This is very important to my teaching today. Every problem in the world is simply a violation of a law. Every problem. I hope at the end of this year, you will fall in love with law. You will respect law. You'll be afraid of breaking laws again. Because everything you're going through right now, including our sinful nature, is simply a result of someone breaking law. Rebellion is the word in Hebrew for disobedience. Uh, write the word rebellion down. Very important word, rebellion. The word rebellion simply means against the known will of the manufacturer. The word in Hebrew for rebellion is the word S-I-N. It's a Hebrew word. It's sin. Sin is not things you do in Hebrew. Sin is simply rebellion against the known war laws of God. So when you say someone has sinned, it doesn't mean that they lied or stole or something. It means they violated a law. So the word in Hebrew, when it says Adam sinned, it's, it, the Hebrew word is Adam rebelled against the known will of God. So violation of law is simply knowing what the manufacturer says, but you decide to break that law. It's called sin. So I call it the law of disobedience. You know... The more I think about this, the disobedience of man activated death. The disobedience of man gave life to death. The disobedience of man resurrected death. The disobedience of man woke up death. When man disobeyed God, man created a new law. It was called the law of death. Remember now, to create a new law, you got to disobey the old one. The old law is don't touch the tree. Otherwise, you will surely wake up, die. <laughs> now, if you don't touch the tree, die stays dead. So, the law of die is inactive. Death has no power. The law of death is death is powerless. You can give power to death if you violate the first law. Disobey the laws of God. Don't touch the tree. In other words, the disobedience of man created the law of death. This is so simple. Religion has messed this thing right up. It's very simple. As a matter of fact, I put it this way. God gave us a simple answer to the problem. Look at this verse of scripture. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Paul says, the sting of death is what? Sin. What is sin? Rebellion against the law of God. And the power of sin is what? The law. Ooh, Jesus, Lord. Okay, put it this way. Where does, where, where does sin come from? We know where death comes from. Death comes from sin. It says that. But where did sin come from? It says sin came from the law. Wait a minute. What's he talking about? Here's a simple answer. Everybody say rebellion. Okay, you cannot rebel unless there is a law. Got it, Pastor Rich? See, <laughs> if there's no law, you can't break a law. And the first thing God gave man is law. Which means he automatically gave him the opportunity to rebel against it when he gave him a will. Look at the verse then. The power of sin is what? The law. Sin gets its power from men breaking the law. How do you break the law? By rebelling. What is rebelling? Sin. So when you rebel against the law of God, that's sin, the result is you give death a sting. Okay, 
death is like a big bumblebee with no stinger. Beautiful insect, lovely, nice wings, beautiful colors. You could enjoy it all your life. And it can never sting you. And God says, Adam, here's your bumblebee. You got this thing in your hands. You can decide to give that bee a sting. So it can sting you and kill you. The sting of death is what? Sin. That means death was made without a sting. <laughs> if you disobey me, Adam, you give death power to kill you. So ladies and gentlemen, write this down. The law is the original standard God set for mankind. But a new law is created by breaking the old law. If you don't want to die, you keep the law. Just like a fish. The law of fish is water. That's a law. Fish was created by God to live in water. That's a law. If you take the fish out of the water, you don't need to kill it. Death is in the whole process. We used to go fishing from time to time, uh, Pastor Jay and others, and, and sometimes we would, we'd pull up a fish, and Pastor Jay would say, put that back, that's too small. Usually Richard caught them kind. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Smaller fish. <laughs> He'd say, no, we can't eat that, put it back. Now, the fish would be out of water, flap, 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 gasping, <gasps> almost dead. We'd take the hook out of his mouth, and the fish limp and you throw it back in the water a couple minutes it's on its side it floats suddenly it jump and then it takes off it almost died but then you put it back in its law if you are in death and you want life back. You don't go forward. That's the land. You won't go backward. That's the ocean. You, you won't go back where you came from to get the original standard. I am afraid. And I'm going to say this publicly now because I want this to get on TV and get you all talk about this. I got a call this week that our government is uh, considering legalizing gambling for Bahamians. Now, listen to me. Listen, I, I can't tell people what to do, okay? But I'm talking openly now. Listen to me. This book says, he who chases fantasies shall grow poor. It's not a word for gambling. God says, look, he who doesn't earn working with his own hands shall become poor. Now, some of y'all, I know, no member of our church by his numbers. I know that. I know that. We don't live by chance. You're violating a law. He who doesn't work with his own hands and earn a living for his family is based on an infidel. Okay, listen to me. Let me tell you the, the danger of this. If something is happening in your community and it's illegal, that means it's not lawful. So it cannot become officially your culture. But once you make it a law, you've just changed the culture of your whole country. Just like that. Culture. Which means 
it's not you I'm concerned about. It's your grandchild who have culture means to grow in. They will grow up taking chances. You're going to lose the refrigerator you work for all your life. They're going to gamble that. They're going to, the house you leave them, you watch. That culture will become so strong. They will sell their children in 2025 to pay off a gambling debt. Not because many are doing something means you make it a law. I mean, if that's the case, you might as well go to the next step. Let's make sweetheart in the law. It is now legal to have more than one wife. Marry one and have ten on the side, legally. Everybody smoking dope. Let's make dope a law. Send so many people taking it. No. Statement again. A new law is created by breaking an old one. The minute you move away from God's original standards, you're on your own. You got your own laws now, which means you got your own consequences and your own culture and your own damnation. My heart is full of his law. David says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By adhering and heeding to the laws of God. Write this down, please. Sin gave life to death, and the law of sin gave birth to the law of death. Laws are created by the few, but it affects the many. Remember that. You quote that. Adam had everybody in his body right here. He had six billion people right here. One man had everybody in him. And God says, please don't break that law. Why? When you make a law, a new law, it affects unborn children. Listen to this. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for this man to be alone. God gave man the law before he made the woman. When Eve came, she was as safe as the law Adam kept. In them was family. God says, Eve, Adam, fill the whole earth. He was carrying everybody. That means when you break a law, you are transferring a rebellious spirit to generations. When you create one law for your own generation because you want something, you got to think about 50 generations down the road who will be victims of a law you made. I was thinking, I was reading in Newsweek this past week. It says, you know, that, uh, they have passed a law in Washington, D.C. Two men can get married, two women can get married, two women. They say they can adopt children. And I'm thinking, wow, if I was one of those kids who was adopted, and I got two fathers, or two, I don't know what you call them, which one is the mother? I don't know what to call them. So who do I call mom? So I got the two men, and they taking care of me, and, you know, cleaning me, and washing for me, and babying me, and paying my tuition, and, and, and what do I call y'all? Now watch this. This is a law now, okay? So I'm creating in this child, and to me, I personally, look at the TV, please. I call that child abuse. Because this child has no way of, con of deciding. The child can't decide. What is a normal family anymore? You've taken this kid who was three years old, doesn't have any understanding of life, and you are forcing on him a perception of your life. That's child abuse. Write me a letter. kid have no way of making a decision by the time he's seven years old. It's violation. But you see, you make a law in the House of Congress. You make a law in the House of Parliament. But you forget that that law affects the whole country. 
So lawmakers, I warn you. God will judge you by the laws you make. Make sure the laws line up with his laws. You'll have a righteous country. The word righteous means to be in right positioning with God's laws. That's all it means. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord because righteousness exalts a nation. But sin, rebellion against the laws, is a reproach to every people. God said, look, you can make your laws, but don't violate mine in the process. Good Friday is about God lining us back up with his laws. That's why Christ is called the righteous one. See, make a note of this. Law affects generations, and therefore laws create a culture. When Adam sinned, he didn't know we were going to be suffering from that 7,000 years later it was a personal decision to eat that fruit personal but he prayed the law and that law is what got your brother sick now and that cancer can't get out of his gut because the law of death is in the cells and here you are sick and you were paying all this money to try to get well because one man 7,000 years ago made a decision to break a law and now we tamper with laws still Well, I'm already doing it. So, you don't do things because everybody's doing it. You do things because they are right or wrong. It, it's, it's, it's not, it's not. Basically, democracy is a gang ideology. It's a gang. It's just not a big gang. Whoever gang is the biggest, that's the one who rules the turf. I'm sorry to reduce that to that vulgar, but it's a gang. That's why we're in trouble. I mean, sit here singing, and I mean, I, I, I spoke to a pastor the other day. Church is in Washington, massive church. He said, it's a law if a guy wants to marry another guy in my congregation. I'm against it, but it's a law. He could sue me. I said, really? He said, it's a law. He said, you don't understand, Pastor Miles. This is no suggestion. It's now a law. He said, and we had no say in it. It came down to us. When Adam fell, everybody fell. I put it this way. Man is born under the law of sin and death because another man break the law. We are born under it. Adam became a sinner. You were born one. Are you getting this? See, the guy who break the law had to break it. But you and I even have to break it. We are born under the effects of it. I understand that there's going to be a referendum in our country. I'm saying to this church right now, think carefully, please. That means they are putting the power of the future in your hands. The same way God did to Adam. You decide whether you want your grandchildren to be gambling or whether you want them to be workers. You will decide that in a referendum. We are not here to deal with no politics. We're here to deal with the politics of the kingdom of God's laws. we got to obey God's laws. God is always right. Just like Ford Motor Company and gasoline. In other words, we need to stay true to the eternal laws. Write this down quickly. This is very important. Jesus came to earth to restore the law of God on earth. Romans 7, powerful verse, verse 12 says what? So then the law is what? Holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Let's clear the air, Paul says. Nothing wrong with the law. The law of God is what? Good, holy, and righteous. Look at Matthew 5. Jesus says, therefore, do not think that I came to destroy or abolish the law, he says. I came to not just only obey it, but to fulfill it. Why? The eternal laws of God are permanent, young people. You don't tamper with them. 
Thou still shall not tell lies. Thou still shall not bear false witness. Thou still shall not cover your neighbor's goods and try to live beyond your means. Thou still shall not cover thy neighbor's wife. Thou still shall not. Thou still shall not. Thou, no matter what you do, he still shall not. No matter what the devil tell you, like he talked to Eve, thou still shall not touch that tree. It's an eternal law. God's laws are the only guarantee for social development. They're the only guarantee for political development. The only guarantee for economic... If you obey God's laws, the economy will explode. What do you think is threatening the Bahamas economy right now? What is it? Tell me. What's the number one threat? Crime. Lawlessness. Destroy the country just like that. I am tired of every Monday morning, the top story is a murder. I'm, to, I'm to the point now where... I, I don't buy newspapers anymore. The first page is so depressing. We are living in a society where lawlessness is magnified every Monday morning. Either someone goes to jail or someone gets stabbed or somebody gets shot or an emergency room full of people or something. There's no good news anymore. It's like no one's keeping the law. Why don't you record a, a, a young man stopped at the red light? That's top story. Are you crazy, they said. We only report breaking laws. That's news. We magnify breaking laws. No wonder why we keep getting what we say. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law. The law is holy. The law is pure. The law is righteous. It's good. Now watch what Paul says. I like what Paul says, you know. <laughs> Paul's amazing. Sometimes we think Paul was against the law. But Romans 8, Paul says, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Because through Christ, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Paul says everything is law. Whether it's life or death, it's a law. And it's a matter of who are you under. The mission of Jesus Christ, very quickly. The need of man was to invalidate the law of sin. Adam sinned, we became victims of death and sickness and disease. Which means disobedience caused the fall. Mankind was a victim of laws created by Adam. Therefore, the only way to change a law is to what? You got to create or renew an old law. If you put gasoline, I mean, orange juice in your gasoline tank, and you take it to the place, they say, you know, your car can't run because we got to clean out the fuel system. Then you put it to them, they clean it out. They say, now go back and do what? Put gasoline, go back to the old law. They don't find a new type of fuel for you. When they wash you clean and cleanse you, they say, now go back and obey the old law again. When Christ came on the cross and died for you, he didn't come for you to go start some new stuff. He came to clean you up to go back to the old laws to obey God from the beginning. So the, the, the reason why Christ came is to destroy the law of sin and death and to reverse the law of sin and death. He came to die to restore the old law of life. I put it to you then that the resurrection is really the exciting part of this whole thing. Uh, this is a statement here that I will never forget. This is what the Lord showed me this morning. True law is established by the creator. Everybody say true law. True law can never be destroyed. Now this term true law must be studied. True law means the one from the manufacturer. When someone makes a knife, I assume they make it to to cut things and slice things and chop things. Am I right? Are you sure? Okay. Now here's a guy who takes the same knife and he cuts somebody's throat. The knife is innocent. The law of knives is you use this to slice tomatoes, chop onions, and cut meat. Not to starve people and cut people's throat. But you can use that same instrument and destroy you violated the law of that instrument and it becomes destructive. In other words, true law 
can only be disobeyed, can never be destroyed. True law never goes away. Somehow man has gotten the idea that he's smarter than God. You know, we, we can make laws that God, God don't understand, you know, that a male and female is supposed to be the God that man, God, that's archaic. It's like it's as if God's stupid. I mean, we are so educated, it's amazing. If you got a baby, it's an inconvenience, you kill it. We call it abortion, God calls it murder. I mean, it depends on what you want to call it, it's the same thing. But we have this idea that you know something? Uh, uh, <laughs> this, this, this is the law now. So you create a law, but you can't change the original true law. In other words, true law will always restore order. When something is wrong in your life or in society, you want to go back and find the old law. It never changes. Your rectum is still an exit. Let me say what Paul said. I'm thinking about it. Paul says, if they live like this, they'll receive their due penalty in their own bodies. Now, what he mean by that is, if you pass a law like that, in 20 years, there could be some disease. And then they could come with another law. Well, we got to change the law. It is now an exit again. In other words, the, the original law cannot be canceled. You can walk away from it. You can deny it. You can pretend it doesn't exist. But it always wins. That's why law is restored by resurrecting the original law. When Jesus died on the cross, he was dealing with the most amazing problem on earth. He was dealing with that disobedience problem. Because that's the law that caused sin to come. Now, here's how it works on the cross. And this is where I want to end up here. Some verses of scripture to see this, okay? Romans 5.12 says what? Let's read together. Therefore, just as one man's sin, sin entered the world through one man and through and, and death through that sin. Now notice how it, it works out, eh? One man disobeyed, and one man caused what? Sin to come. And sin brought what? Death. Okay, that's the scenario. Uh, I think I need to demonstrate. Can you come here, please, Sean? Yeah, I need two more verses. Let me see. Uh, can you come here? I want to show you all this so you don't forget. Can you face that way? Stand right behind him right there for me, please. Okay. This is death. Death was bought by sin. Yes. Okay. I need one more person. Can you come here with me? Yeah. Come here. Ethne, Ethne, sorry. Stand right here. Okay. This is disobedience. Not personally. Okay. Now, I want you to see that verse. Put the verse back up. It says, when Adam disobeyed God, he sinned. Sin is rebellion against the law which produced death. Now, our number one problem is this fella right here. Am I right? This is the fella no one could fix. We can't get rid of him. We can't stop him. The guy controlling everybody. Matter of fact, Hebrews 2 says that, that, that it's the only thing that man fears. The fear of death. Okay. So, where does death get its power from? Sin. Where does sin get its power from? Disobedience. All right? Now, watch how this works. All right? Watch the next verse. Very important. Romans 5. Read. But if by the trespass of one man, that's the disobedience, death what? Reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the man Jesus Christ? 
Now, look at the condition of righteousness here. This guy disobeyed what? A law. The law produced sin. Sin produced death. So our problem is, how do you conquer death? By the power of obedience. Notice it says here, it says that uh, consequently just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for who? All of us. So also the result of one act of righteousness. What is righteousness? Lining up with the law again. Was justification brought to all. Look at another verse. Verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, which means die, took their lives, so also through the obedience of what? One man, the many will be made righteous again. By the what? Disobedience. What do you disobey? Laws. This is deep. We thought it was the devil. The problem is law. We disobeyed law. When we disobeyed law, we became disobedience, which produced sin, which produced death. We got to find someone who will obey. Reverse it. Someone who comes and obeys. Now the problem is, if everybody is born like this fella, and the spirit of disobedience dwells in us, we cannot obey. We need someone to come from the outside. We are all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, in sin. We were conceived. We were born with this stuff in us. We were born with disobedience, with sin and death inside of us. Born with it. We can't find the strength to obey. We need someone who has no sin, no disobedience, no rebellion, and no death inside of him. Oh, Jesus, we're getting ready to go now. Jesus comes to earth to deal with the problem. He had to break the power of death which means you got to break the power of sin. Which means you got to break the power of disobedience. Woo. That's why his first statement, I didn't come to destroy the law. Because it's the law that's got you all messed up. I am the last Adam. The first Adam messed you all up. The next Adam is going to bless you all up. I come to obey the laws of God so that I can destroy sin. All I got to do I don't need to deal with death. Still ain't get it. Death is not an objective. It's a byproduct. Death is a result of something. If I can fix the thing, then death goes back to sleep. Yeah. So, Jesus says the source of death is sin, and sin produced death, so the power of death must be in sin. Which means that if sin is solved, if I can get rid of sin, I'm getting ready to show up by myself now. Death is automatically destroyed. Hebrews 2. He came to destroy the power of death. He didn't come to destroy death. Remember that die was always there. We gave die power and called it death. If you take the power out of it, it's now die again. 
That's why the Bible says, get ready for this, Pastor. That's why the Bible says, if you come to Christ, oh, Jesus. Coach Darwell, we went to your mama's funeral last week. Now listen to me. If you come to Christ and you die in Christ, Amen. listen to me, young people, you're no longer dead. Bad English. You only die. When you are killed by die, it is called death. But when you die in Christ, it is called sleep. You cannot wake a dead person. But if somebody is sleeping, one person got it. He says, look. On the cross, I took the stuff out of death. Now, it's going to still hit your body. But the problem is, death is now illegal. It cannot keep you in the grave. It is impossible. Because the power that death had to keep you in the grave has been broken. Which means that the resurrection is not... It's not you getting rid of debt. It's debt having to let you go. In other words, Jesus said this in Romans 16 through Paul. He says, in the same way, come on, read out loud with me. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its evils. For sin shall not be your master anymore because you are not under law but under grace. You break the law of death. So the work of Jesus Christ on this cross is the power that brought resurrection power. See, Romans 6 verse 15 says, read it with me. I love this one, read what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means, Paul says. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone who obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to disobedience, which leads to, obedience rather leads to righteousness, he says, but thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Now, now listen to me. Everybody's a slave. That's what he's saying. You obey in something. And both of them got a, a, a consequence. Either you're a slave of sin that's rebellion or slave of righteousness. That's the laws of God. You can decide which one you will be following today. And they are both predictable. If you obey God, if this guy becomes obedience, then this is no longer rebellion. This is grace. And if this is grace, then this got to be life. <laughs> and so we find... A simple conclusion. I love it. First Corinthians 15. Read. Death. Come on, say it loud. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Why? Oh, grave. Oh, death. Paul laughs. Paul says, "Where's your victory? Oh, death. Where's your sting?" Paul was like this, thing in his air. Yeah, 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 yeah. You cannot keep me. Imagine going to the cemetery in a casket laughing. <laughs> this is going to be fun for a couple of years. You cannot hold me. Why? The power that you had has been canceled. Oh, hallelujah. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ who did something very interesting. He obeyed. 
In other words, write this down. Jesus made debt illegal again. His obedience. I will never be afraid of death. Never. Never. If I die in the morning or die 10 years from now, it doesn't matter. I win. Because Jesus Christ came after Adam and became the obedient one. His obedience canceled sin and made it grace. And his grace is what gave us eternal life again. And death has no more power. That's why you will be raised from the dead. He made death illegal. Everybody read Matthew 27. Come on, out loud, go. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Come on, read this one. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs break open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life again. They came out of the tombs and after he rose again, they went into the holy city and appeared to many of their family members. Listen, this happened... <laughs> This happened the weekend that we're talking about right now. Let me tell you what happened here. When he said it is finished, sin was solved. The curtain that was hiding the Ark of the Covenant split from the top, which means no more priests going there to represent you no more. No more lambs and no goats and no bulls. You can come in here freely now because the Lamb of God shed his blood on the cross, opened this whole thing up. He died and the blood was accepted. Everybody is forgiven. Now watch this. It says when that happened, I couldn't stop. The power of death is sin. When he said it's finished, sin fell to the ground. All of a sudden, death turned around. Turned around. Death said, oh my God. All of Moses, them I was holding down, and Joshua, and Micah, and Nahum, and Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, and Daniel, and Haggai, and Zechariah, and Malachi, and Joseph, and David. He said, wait a minute. You must die. They said, no, man. He fixed the thing just now. We gone. See, there? <laughs> Come on, give God a hand. It started already. I said it started already. The resurrection started. That's a verse you don't read much. The thing was broken. Sin, stay right there, please. But that's why we're going to go here to pray. John 11, read. And Jesus said. Now, read this. I never saw this before, okay, Rich? This one is deep. Okay. Mary and Martha have a dead family member, their brother. Jesus walks up to the room. He says, why are you all crying? They said, our brother is dead. Three days. Dead. He said, have faith. They said, okay, but you should have been here three days ago. Now, who are they talking to? According to him, they're talking to the resurrection. Now, listen to me. You see, he's saying, look. <laughs> he's saying, the resurrection is not, a, it's not something. It's someone who's going to do something. I'm about to do something. Now, listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. listen. Sin, you still there? Okay. Can you lay over here? I want, I want him to see you good. Sin, you, you need to be seen for the last time. Lay down, my flat. You're dead. Okay, watch this. What is the power of death? Sin. Okay. So the only control death has over me and you is sin. So here comes a guy walking in the room, and there's a dead man. But the fellow walking in the room ain't got no He says, Mary, <laughs> what walked in your house just now is what death's afraid of. She said, 
We know he'll be resurrected in that great day. He said, no, it ain't a day, it's a person. Ain't no sin inside of me. He tell her, let's go where he is laying. They said, really? He said, come on, let's go. And death, can you hold this fellow down for me? Just hold him down. That's what was in that tomb with Lazarus. Lazarus trying to get up. Dead got in. Camera get short of his get dead got in. Fix the screens. I want people to see that at home. That's the picture of death right there. Tight shot. No, wrong one. Him. Not me. You listening to me over there? Tight shot right here. Tight shot. That, go go out a little bit. I want you to see both of them. Come back a little bit. Come on, see both of them. Go back, go back. I want to see both heads. Okay, that's it, right there. That's what's happening to your grandmother right now. That's what your granddaddy looks like right now in the grave. That's what your cousin looks like right now. That's what your husband looks like. That's Dr. Chara right now. That's your mother, Kirsch. That's death saying, I got you now. But he walked into the room. The only thing that gave death that power was sin. And here comes sinlessness. Without spot, Brother Richard said on Friday, without wrinkle, he walked in that room without spot. He says, Mary, you ain't got to wait for no day. Wherever there's no sin, there's no death. And ain't no sin inside of me. He walked in that room and he said, take me to where dead is holding him down. <laughs> when Jesus stood outside that tomb, death was saying, oh my God, someone's coming. I ain't sure who it is, but I think they got power to make me leave you alone. And all he had to say was, he didn't even bother with death. He didn't even talk to death. That ain't no problem. Sin is the problem. He said, Lazarus, death starts struggling. Come on, struggle, man. Lazarus, do you hear my voice, son? Lazarus, get up, boy. I'm talking to you. Lazarus, Lazarus, fight that boy. Lazarus, 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 get up, Lazarus. Lazarus! Let him up, Lazarus! Come forward! Come on out of here! I want you all to watch this. Here's the big embarrassing news. Death, watch the fella walk out. That's the good news. <laughs> Don't look at him. He gone. He gone. Oh Lord, he gone. What happened to your power, man? No sting. You don't got no sting. He said, he ain't got no sting no more. Jesus said, watch the next verse. He says, and whoever believes Say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Whoever believes in me will what? Live. Even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Why? Die is dead. Do you believe this? Asking you, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Lift your hands and believe this. Say it again, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I'm not afraid of death. Last verse. Read this verse, please. Very important verse. First Corinthians 15, read. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. For the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since 
death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come, glory, when he will hand over the kingdom, the colony, back to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion and authority. He deserves a little bit of praise this morning. That's the resurrection power. That's what he came to do. I put it to you, my family, that today was the greatest act of deliverance in history. Some deliver us from slavery, but he delivered us from death. That guy up there has been embarrassed by Calvary. When Satan thought Jesus was finished on the cross, it was the act of him losing his power of death. I say to you, if your parents died, my mother is buried up, up there in that cemetery, and I just can't wait to see my mom again. Man, I tell you, that's going to be a great day. My daddy is here. Dad, you're going to see mom again, eh? Very soon. Don't say soon too fast. Stand up. Now, let me see how 86 years old look. That's my daddy. All right. See you soon. You can see it soon. Not too soon now. Don't talk too much. No, 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 Jesus coming, is it? Jesus coming. Okay, all right. That's good. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's wait, wait till Jesus come, yeah. I want you to go see mom right now. Don't, 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 don't do that. But you see, <laughs> in other words, you have no more fear of death. Don't be afraid. If someone is sick and they don't look too well, if they are filled with the Holy Spirit, if Jesus Christ is in them, all you got to say is he has no stain. Death has no stain. Jesus said, all those who die in Christ, when the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. Not just the dead, the dead in Christ. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.